So, how can we use our ideas to change the world? I think that's a, actually a pretty good question for Ted. Um, and I think it's an important one because if you reflect on it, you probably have had many good ideas yourselves, right? We're a bright bunch. Um, and so the issue then is, well, how do we actually use them to change things? Um, that's the thing that I study, um, and it's actually a pretty cool job to have, uh, looking at where new ideas come from, how they spread, uh, and how we can get better at using them to change the world. It might seem a little bit odd, though, to have an innovation guy here talking about this theme, old ideas in the new world, because after all, innovation is all about the new. And we often think about ideas in this way, right, that they, they, they battle, that the new idea has to triumph over old ones so that it has space in the world. Um, and I think that we, we often send our ideas out and we think about them fighting for space and for error and things like that. It's interesting, though, because I think the reality is a little bit less dramatic than that, but probably a little bit more interesting. I think it's actually more accurate to think about the new building on the old. Uh, the new world is actually built on old ideas, and as we have new ideas come in, they combine with old ideas. And, they, and as that happens, the old ideas change and they evolve, and they're always there with us as we go forward. So even when we talk about all of the very futuristic stuff like Joel was talking about earlier, that's built on old ideas. Um, and the, we can only make our new ideas real and have an impact on things when they integrate with the old. When I told my friends that I was going to do this talk about this topic, my oldest friend, Rick DeWitt, got very excited about it. And he sent me a message and he said, you know, the one thing that you taught me about innovation was that it consists of three things. One, a new idea. Two, one that creates value. And three, it's become real. It's actual. Um, and that's actually the definition of innovation that I use when I do my teaching and everything else, executing new ideas to create value. And it's really important to understand that we actually need all three of those parts to innovate. Right? The new idea part, we always tend to understand. Right? So the new idea is it's the flash of inspiration. It's the light bulb going off over your head. It's the, you know, the, 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 the bright insight that Coleridge got in his opium dreams. All right? it's, 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 that, it's that spark. Um, and so we all understand that. Uh, and we, we, we know that we have to have an idea to, to, to create something new. Um, but the fact of the matter is it's not enough to just have the idea, right? The critical thing is that we actually have to make the idea real. And that's the monkey wrench part where we actually go to work uh, and we actually have to figure out how to get that idea out of our heads where it's perfect and make it work in the real world where things are not perfect, where they're messy and chaotic and uncertain. Um, and figuring out how to get the old to interact with the new is actually an essential part of innovating. And if we don't do that, then it doesn't matter how good the idea is. Uh, because if it's not real, it has no impact. Um, so we have to have an idea. We have to make it real. But then even that's not enough. We then also have to create value for people. Uh, so we actually have to figure out what kind of problem are we going to solve with our great idea? How are we going to create value for people? What, what things will we unlock for people by actually executing that new idea? Uh, so innovation is actually something that requires all three things to work, right? New idea, making it real, and unlocking value for people. And if we don't have all three things, then we can't innovate. So I want to tell you two stories that illustrate how that works. Right? The first, we saw some, some pictures of patent applications earlier in one of the talks. Um, and this is one from Chester Carlson. In the 1930s, he was a physicist, and he decided that he wanted to be an inventor. He read in a science journal that you could use electrostatic charges to attach ink to paper. And he said, that would be a cool thing to work on. And so he started working in his kitchen for about five years. And after that time, he put this patent in. And he was given the patent for the process of xerography, right, copy machines. Um, so he figured out how to make that work. He took that idea that started out as science fiction in a journal and turned it into reality. So he had the great idea and he made it real. Now all he had to do was get people to start using it, uh, which ended up being not so easy. He started out trying to sell the idea himself and building a machine and, and retailing it, uh, which didn't actually work very well. So after a couple of years, he sold a license to the Halloid photo Photographic Company in Rochester, New York, and he started working with them. And after eight years, they launched the Xerox Model A photocopier. It was the world's first Xerox machine. So they launched it to great fanfare, 
sent it out into the world, and it utterly and completely failed. Right? And the reason is that they hadn't figured out what value they were creating for it. They said, hey, here's a really cool thing to do, and they did it, but they hadn't figured out what's the value that's happening from this idea that we've executed. And the thing that they did was they said, well, because it's a machine, it should replace another machine. So the thing to replace was a mimeograph, because everyone had a mimeograph machine. The problem was, when they went to businesses and they said, hey, we've got this new thing, it replaces a mimeograph, the businesses would look at it and say, well, yeah, but yours costs six times as much, the cost per copy is about the same, and we only use the mimeograph machine about 100 times a month, so why would we, why would we spend the money on, on your new thing? Um, and so no one bought it. So Carlson and Halloid went back to the drawing board, and they worked and worked and worked, and a few years later they launched the Xerox Series 9. This is the one that became the most successful product launch in US business history. It made $500 million over five years. Uh, and the technology inside of it was exactly the same, basically, as the technology that Carlson had come up with on his kitchen table 20 years earlier. So it wasn't a technological innovation. Right? The innovation was in the value that they created for people. And they actually realized, well, OK, we're not going to replace a mimeograph machine. How else do we get permanent copies right now? The way that that happened was through typists. And they actually said, well, maybe we should just replace a typist instead of a mimeograph. That required all kinds of changes in the business model because only large companies had a bunch of typists in a typing pool, so you had to sell to large companies. That meant you needed a highly tra trained sales force, the white shirt, blue suit, red tie, all that kind of stuff. So it was the business model innovation that actually created the value from the great idea. And it was only finding that value we're going to replace a typist rather than a mimeograph that Xerox allowed Xerox to finally succeed. So that's a fairly typical innovation story. Right? That's story number one. Story number two is both more recent and more ancient. About a year ago, my wife Nancy and I went on a trip to Uluru and Alice Springs. And in the back of one of the art stores there, we met a guy named Walala Chapeljari. And he was making a painting. And he was painting a story that had been passed on to him by his relatives as it had been for hundreds of generations over thousands of years. Um, so Australian Aboriginal art um, tells stories that are 30,000 years old. It's about as old an idea as you can possibly get. And I think the way that those stories have become integrated into the new world is a really interesting innovation story. So the issue there is that when uh, so, so Walala, about 20 years before we met him, 30 years, in 1984, he and his family came in from the Gibson Desert. It was two, two women and five children. And on the day that they came in from the desert, they got picked up by a truck and brought into town. That day was the first day in their entire lives that any of them knew that a truck existed. It was the first time that any of them knew that Australians of European descent existed. It was the last time that that happened in Australian history in 1984, and Walala Chapeljari was in that group. Out of that group, five of the, the, the young children became artists, um, and they have used this art, uh, as many other artists have, to bridge a gap between uh, cultures, between the, the, Aboriginal culture, the Aboriginal cultures and ours, the Western Australians. And the, the issue was they were trying to figure out, well, how can we communicate our culture and our beliefs and our connection to country uh, to these people that are now inhabiting our land with us. And they figured out that by taking these stories that were 30,000 years old and combining them with the relatively new innovation of painting on canvas, that was only about 500 years old at the time, that they could actually communicate in a different way. And so people have been using, the, ab the, ab the Aboriginal people have been using art to communicate with others for about 40 years now, and they've been doing it very effectively. In the 1990s, the Spinifex people in South Australia made a land claim, a federal land claim, and included as part of that were two gigantic paintings that told the stories of their ancestry and the people and their interactions with the country that had taken place over centuries. They looked a lot like this one by Mona Mitakiki Shepherd. Um, and they, they, those were an essential part of the claim of ownership of that land. And so they took the old idea, they combined it with the new, and they figured out, here's how we're going to communicate. And it led to an innovation in art 
and innovation in communication. And obviously, there's still plenty of issues there about how our two cultures, or our bunches of cultures, interact. But it's something that made a substantial jump forward. I think these two stories tell us a lot about how innovation happens. Uh, and like I said earlier, we need to have all three parts, right? It's the idea, it's making it real, and it's creating value for people. If we only have two out of the three, then what we have is a trigger for innovation, right? So if we don't have the new ideas, um, I, read, I made the little red circle myself last night. Um, so so, so if, we all, if we don't have new ideas, right, then we have things that are real and they're creating value, but if the environment changes, then we have fear. Right. This is the situation that the Australian Aborigines were in uh, prior to um, starting to, to, to do the art. They had tradition, they had a way of doing things that was real. It created value for them, but as the environment that they lived in changed, it actually created friction, and they had fear because their, their way of living was actually threatened. And so the way that they got around it was injecting new ideas. Right? They, they, had, they had two of the three, they had things that were real, they had value, they needed the new ideas to innovate and to figure out a way around that problem. Right? That's a kind of abstract way to tell that story, but it's also a very common motivator for business innovation. When you face destruction, uh, right, you have fear and then you start to innovate. So that's one trigger of innovation. The second is when we have an idea, we've got a problem that we're trying to solve, but we haven't made it real. Right? And that's actually a really common one. That's when we have fantasy. So fantasy is the second trigger of innovation. That's what Chester Carlson was, was triggered by when he decided that he wanted to build the photocopier. He had read, it was literally science fiction, right? He read about it in a science, in a science magazine. It was set, the, the, the magazine said, hey, you could do this. He said, I will try it. And then it took him five years to work it out, right? That, that process of making it real. And so anytime we've got a great idea, if we want to make a change in the world, we actually have to make it real. So we have to go beyond fantasy. It's a great trigger for innovation, but we have to add the third element, making it real before we actually innovate. The third trigger is a, a kind of a tricky one, right? This is where we have an idea and we've made it real, but we haven't found the value for it yet, right? And when we have that, we have frustration, right? That's the situation, again, that Carlson was in after he had invented the photocopier. He thought, hey, I've done the hard work. I've invented my thing. Now people should just buy it. That's never the way that it works, right? Joel mentioned earlier Kodak. Uh, Kodak, I think, is really interesting because Kodak invented digital photography, right? They hold all of the patents. When they went bankrupt two years ago, the most valuable thing on their books was all of the patents they held on the technology that put them out of business, right? The problem that they had was they couldn't figure out what value does it create? And they couldn't get the timing right, uh, which was the other issue from Joel's talk, right? We have to figure out not just what the value is, but when is it going to get here, right? And, and that's where Carlson was at well, as well, right? He invented the Xerox machine. It took them 20 years and three tries to figure out what value does this actually create. And it was only once they had all three parts in place that they figured out this is what the innovation actually is. So my friend Rick and I, 40 years ago, when we were running around in the rain of Oregon playing football, I don't think either of us really pictured where we were going to end up today. Um, his business card now says mad scientist, um, and mine says idea connector. Uh, Rick spends his time coding software. Uh, last week he was over in Washington, D.C. talking to NASA about some of his physics ideas, and he invents stuff. He made a great invention recently of a tool that removes um, burrs in, in public parks, uh, and he's working on selling that. So he does stuff uh, all around making ideas real, right? My job is to study people like Rick and to try to figure out how to get more effective at making our ideas real, because if the new world is built on old ideas, we have to figure out how to take those old ideas and integrate them with our new ones if we actually want to change the world. So if you've got a great idea and you're thinking about how can I make a change with it? Just remember, it's not enough to have the idea. You also have to make it real, and you have to figure out what value does it unlock for people. If you do all of that, then you're innovating. Thanks.